So about science in Israel, let me first of all just give you a couple of main things and then we can talk about it in detail. The first thing is that the Israeli science, science and technology in Israel, and I'm including not only pure research, but pure research, applied research, high tech, technology, and in general engineering and so on, is um, just one of the top in the world. So the Israeli science, uh, even though Israel is so small with just a few million people, their science is among the best in the world, both inside Israel and outside of <coughs> Israel. The uh, level of the Israeli scientists, the uh, discoveries that are made there, the technology that is developed there, the inventions that are made there, are regarded enormously highly, both inside Israel, where uh, science and technology is very well supported. Uh, the population regards it very highly. <clears throat> on the inside and from the outside, if you look at the United States, at Europe, all the top institutions, they have the highest regards for Israeli uh, science and scientists. So the top institutions, uh, Princeton, the Institute for Advanced Study, Harvard, Yale, have uh, visitors, continuous visitors uh, from Israel, uh, faculty, postdocs, students, uh, Israeli scientists are coming all the time. And uh, the selections, as you, I'm sure you well know, are enormously competitive. For every position, even every postdoc position, there are probably 300 applications. And only a handful <laughs> are selected. And among the hand handful selected, there are frequently one or two Israelis. So that tells you about the, the level of the scientists uh, in Israel. So those are uh, uh, just sort of the highlights of what I want you to, to remember about the, the uh, Israeli uh, science. For example, they are ranked high. If you look at any uh, uh, ranked publications of where countries stand in uh, science and technology, Israel is always ranked among the, the top 10, depending on how you rank them by what uh, category. So um, it's ranked, for example, number four. If you look in the world, number four in the world, this tiny Israel with only like three, four big universities is ranked number four in the world in the number of uh, published papers per person, per million people. Mm -hmm. So in publication, in scientific publications, they are ranked number four in the world. Pretty astonishing. Very enormously impressive. I, I know every time I go to Israel, which is every year, and I go to the Weizmann Institute, Tel Aviv <coughs> University, Hebrew University. I'm always very impressed with <coughs> the, the level of science that is being done uh, there. It is absolutely top weight. It's the same level of science that is done here at Princeton University. It's done at Harvard. It's done at other institutions in the fields that I'm familiar with, which is <coughs> physics, astrophysics, biology, genetics, medicine, absolutely top in the world. So here is number four in the number of scientific uh, publications. Uh, Israel uh, has the highest number of scientists, technicians, and engineers per capita. So the number of scientists per population is the high highest in the world, higher than in the United States. So in Israel, um, they have 140 scientists, uh, technicians, and engineers per uh, 10,000 employees. In the United States, it's 85 compared to 140. I mean, that really is pretty impressive. So you know, when we just say in words, Israeli uh, science is, is near the top or very high and so on. It, it's hard to get a feeling for what it really means. But if you look at the numbers, 
and you think about how small Israel is, uh, how young Israel is, where, where and when Israel started. It started not that many years ago in a place that was a desert. It was really a, not a very developed place. And look where it is today. I mean, that is pretty astonishing. It really is amazing. So, you know, as I frequently say, we hear a lot of negatives about uh, situations from all kinds of directions. Uh, but it is really very important to see the enormously impressive positives about Israel, which are just um, um, mind-boggling, if you think about it, that a small country started, and in, in, in I was born there when before there was an Israel, so I remember those days. And um, to see where, where the country went in such... In, in just a one person's lifetime, really, from from nothing, from developing the land to where they are today near the top of the world in all of those activities of science and technology. You know, that's impressive. The money uh, to support science in Israel in general comes from uh, two uh, sources in general, there are others. One is from the Israeli government, uh, Israel, is, unlike the United States, you don't have that much alumni support that support, you know, Princeton and Harvard and all the institutions. In Israel, they, this is not very, very common. So it comes from the government, and the government put, uh, uh, you know, their money where their mouth is and started supporting uh, science. They developed uh, a minister for science, which we don't even have in the United States. So they have minister of science. Uh, there is Academy of Sciences in Israel, <coughs> there is uh, Academy of Higher Education in Israel, and there is support for the universities and for science. And in fact, for a while, the government supported by a huge <coughs> amount, I think 50, more than 50%, a lot of the Israeli startup companies. I'll come to startups. Israel startup companies in high tech is only second in the world to the United States. That is amazing. Israel has thousands of startup companies. The young kids are very bright. They start up companies right and left all the time. And they are second in the world uh, to the United States. Uh, outside of North America, number one uh, top listed uh, companies, Israeli companies on the NASDAQ, outside of North America. And again, think about Israel in terms of all those other countries. Europe, the Middle East, Japan, every, every place else. And Israel is at the top there. You know, if, if, if you're not astonished by that, you should be, because that is very impressive. And the second uh, uh, resource that is available for the universities, the research institutions, and so on, comes from um, uh, Jews all over the world that are contributing. We are all familiar with the... United States with the American Friends of Tel Aviv University or the Weizmann Institute, of Hebrew University. And that's very, very important for supporting education and research and, uh, and technology and developments in Israel. Those are the two main resources. As you know, the, the tuition at the universities is very small in Israel. So unlike in the United States, which supports a big part of the university's uh, expenses. In Israel, <laughs> this is very small. So it's the government and, and, uh, and outside contributions, and those outside contributions are very important. So uh, the universities also have gone through some rough times financially, but, you know, the Israeli population and the love and the dedication for science, for technology, for high-tech, uh, the innovations in Israel is so strong that even in, st in spite of a bad economy or bad financial situation at some of the univer at all the universities for a while, the, the education program uh, has continued to, s to, to, to excel. So that's even in spite of, and, and sometimes the economic situation is not so good. Though I know here we are very, privileged, for example, at, at the university to have 
teaching assistants and support and funding of students and all kinds of things. That's not available in, in Israel universities. So they have very few teaching assistants and don't, don't have that much money to support their students. You know, it's not as easy as it is here. In spite of that, you get some of the brightest minds, some of the top scientists, top engineers that come out of those universities. Uh, Israel is in Israel at the Weizmann Institute, for example, recently, the top European awards that are millions of dollars went to Israeli scientists. These are the top European awards in physics, in astrophysics, in some biologists and so on, uh, went to Israelis. So the Israeli science uh, is of high reputation, as you can see, not only by uh, appointments, the universities and institutions recruit Israeli scientists to come here, which is uh, a very high threshold to pass. You know, the Institute for Advanced Study, Einstein's place, really takes the best in the world. They have two Israelis there among 20-some faculty to our Israelis. That's pretty outstanding. The educational program in Israel is quite different, and it, in fact, it's true in Europe all over, quite different than the United States. Uh, it is much more rigorous, it's much more focused, it's much more uh, traditional than the United States. Uh, I'm not saying that one is better than another. There are pluses and minuses to each system. I think the United States is more sort of feel good, let's make friends, <laughs> let everybody do what they want, let everybody have a choice, you know, everybody feel good about themselves. You know, it's that type of style. In Israel and in Europe, in fact, I think it's more just no, we all have to do this, this, and that, and we all study all of those things, and we, that's what we focus on. And it's, um, they get into, I know in math and science, which I'm more familiar with, um, they get into the higher level math and sciences than they do in the United States, in, in, the, in the different levels of the school systems. One of my uh, a good friend and colleagues in astrophysics is, uh, a professor at the Technion who's an Arab, an, an Israeli Arab. And um, he's a brilliant uh, scientist, uh, very successful, had a position in the United States. He's now a professor at the Technion. Every time I come, he's doing very well. Every time I come there, um, he, he, you know, he always invites me. We uh, then always go to a, a wonderful, uh, dinner with other colleagues together. We go in the Arab little areas there in, in, in Haifa and so on. So you have uh, Israeli Arabs uh, who are on faculty, who are in, in the sciences. It's a very small number, though. Um, I think when the Israeli Arabs go more into the professional schools, they would probably go more into the medicine, law, engineering, a little bit more so, more so than into the pure sciences for some reason. Many innovations, big discoveries that came from Israel. For example, you know, the little flash drives that we all use, that's an Israeli innovation from one of the high-tech companies in Israel. Uh, another example, which I talked last week in, in our sort of Blinz breakfast, the, you know, the, the little camera, in, that's in medicine, the little camera that you can swallow to take, you know, the, the instead of doing the big uh, 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 you know, endoscopy and colonoscopy and so on, the, there is a way that you can just swallow in a little pill, a tiny camera that sort of goes through your whole system and takes pictures while, while it goes through the system. That's an invention from Israel. So it just shows you about the smarts, the innovation, the, the originality of Israeli scientists and engineers. And that's why they do well in, succeed in science, in, in innovations, in patents, <coughs> in technology, in medicine, 
and in the high tech too, because they come with new ideas about what to do. There is a kid that we just you just heard in the news. I just heard about it last couple of days, not from Israel but from England, mm -hmm. who developed something, some app that he sold to Google for I don't know billions of yeah. dollars. Yeah. He's, and he's in high school, thirty. A high school kid for billions of dollars yeah. or millions. Million. I don't know. Yeah. That developed a, an app that can take some big, big text and summarize it, and, and collect it from various places on Google and give you a summary of it. You know, that's a type of thing that Israelis frequently do. So the question is, how does the fact that all the uh, young Israelis have to go and serve two or three years in the army, how does that affect their science? So. Uh, <clears throat> There are several parts to, to the answer to that. First of all, some of the sm very smart, Israel, uh, uh, bright Israeli students, when they finish high school, if they are interested in sciences, in medicine, in, in some of the fields that Israel really needs, Israel has an outstanding program. It's called Atuda Akademai, it means academic uh, direction that they can serve in the army. Well, there are two parts to that. One is that they can serve in the army while pursuing their uh, 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 academic degree. So you can get your uh, Bachelor of Science degree, Bachelor of Arts degree, while you serve in the army. So you do in the army something that relates to academic or to science, and you at the same time take classes and, and, and do your classes. So it may take you more, longer than three years. It's three years in Israel. It takes you longer than three years to get a degree, but you do it together with your army service. And they adapt your army service to be helpful to each other. Then they have another part, really for the most outstanding ones, where you get a deferment from the army. You finish your degree, and then you go back to the army and serve with something that you have studied, whether it's engineering or, it's only in fields that Israel really need. So it's either engineering or medicine or some of the sciences that they need. And then um, what, what the is Israelis do in the army, you know, they're very smart Israelis. So if they have somebody who's very good in science and engineering and they recognize it, they use them uh, to advance both the Israeli uh, military needs in those fields and help those young people. So they use them in some of the Israeli intelligence fields or in some of the other capacity that they can utilize and build on their science. They provide some courses to them and so on. So they really try to do something that will help both the military itself and help the young people in their, in their interest and in education. The question is about the percentage of uh, women in sciences in Israel uh, compared to, to here. I think the numbers, in, it depends on the field. I think the numbers in Israel in some fields are, uh, consider, are higher. I, don't, I wouldn't say considerably, but are somewhat higher than it is here in fields like um, biology, uh, medicine, um, genetics, in, in the bio, biomedical fields, there are a lot of um, very, very strong uh, science, uh, science, science women in Israel. If you go to the Weizmann Institute, which is, you know, I go there every year, and every year I'm just stunned to see how much they are uh, uh, expanding and b building additional buildings in all the fields of mostly biology, all kinds of biotechnology, biogenetics, you know, brain research and so on. And many of the top um, scientists there are women. Uh, the one who received the Nobel Prize in, uh, two Nobel Prize recently in Israel in the sciences, one in biology uh, a few years ago uh, and one in chemistry about a year or two ago. Uh, the one in biology was a woman, is a woman from the Weizmann Institute mm. uh, in biology, and uh, the one in chemistry is a, a man from the Technion. Mm. The universities are built differently. The students don't usually live, not like here, students don't live in 
mostly in the dorms and, and so on. They live at home and some of them work and they come and study. The, the Israeli students, we talked about their education and you asked, they are very practical. They're, I think they are much more practical and goal-oriented than American students uh, in Israel. And that's, that's probably part of their success that they are and that's part of the education that you know you're going in a focused way and you always have to think in Israel okay what's my goal what do I want to do later what do I want to do for my career and when you apply to college unlike the United States here you apply to a college you apply to Princeton University you don't apply to a physics or to a law school or when you apply to college, you, you just apply to university and then you fuss around for two years deciding what you want to do. <laughs> you don't do that in Israel. In Israel, you have to know when you apply to college, you apply to either physics or chemistry or biology or history and you are accepted by the university and the department. So you have to know what you want to study. And in, well. After the army, usually, although not always, so they're a little bit of older, but you have to know. So they're much more focused, they're much more practical, they're much more goal-oriented. I think you're all familiar with the Hubble Space Telescope. It's, it's, it's a, a, a household name. It, it's funny, when I was interviewed in one of my previous uh, visits to, to uh, Israel, I was at the Weizmann Institute, and they sent a reporter from one of the Israeli uh, big newspapers, uh, Haaretz, to, to interview me. They were, you know, it's an Israeli scientist. They wanted to interview. So they came to, to interview me, and it was a big, long spread in, 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 um, in the newspaper um, about an Israeli scientist. And I thought, great, I'll tell them a lot about astronomy and what I do and, and you know, starting from Israel and, and, and all the good stuff. The minute that uh, interviewer uh, heard that I worked at the Hubble Space Telescope, all his questions were about, about the <laughs> Hubble Space Telescope. And I thought that that was quite remarkable, how the Hubble Space Telescope became a household name, a big name in a place like Israel, all over the world. You know, that really was quite stunning to me. So. Uh, so you all know about the Hubble Space Telescope. It's about 20 years old now. It's been in space for about 20 years. And um, it was originally suggested in uh, the 70s. Lyman Spitzer here from Princeton, who was a famous, very famous astrophysicist. He was chair of my department for many years. Uh, he suggested the idea of having a telescope in space in the 40s. It was his original idea. He said, well, we can send now rockets into space. It was World War II, though before, after rockets were starting to fly. And he said, well, you know, we can put a telescope in space above the atmosphere so then we can watch the cosmos, the universe, in a much clearer way without the disturbing um, uh, uh, atmosphere in between. So that was when the original idea came about. Then in the 60s and 70s, he, uh, Lyman Spitzer and John, worked very hard with the astronomical community and Congress to d actually develop a telescope in space, to develop the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was a long story, it took decades and NASA agreed to fund it, and then they decided to cancel it, and Congress decided not to put the money in. And what John did, together with Lyman Spitzer, they went, and that was the first science lobbying in Congress. <laughs> they lobbied Congress about uh, putting the money into funding the Hubble Space Telescopes. And they succeeded, and Congress put the money back and it saved the Hubble Space Telescope, and the Hubble then became a reality. Only 20, 25 years ago it was actually launched, but it became a reality maybe a decade or, or so before. But John fought very hard with, with all along to help, to, to help the Hubble Space Telescope, and um, 
And that's why he and Lyman Spitor, they usually are called the fathers of the Hubble Space Telescope. And as you said, Harold, uh, John has, and NASA has the main science auditorium, is called now the John Bacall uh, Auditorium, and they have a fellowship in his name, and they have uh, an annual lecture in his name, and they want to, whenever they have a new telescope, they want to name it after John. So they are doing a lot, a lot of very nice things uh, in John's name. But um, John helped with this Hubble telescope all, uh, all along. He actually also uh, worked on it, uh, uh, doing science and did research with the Hubble Space Telescope. And John worked a lot with Congress to help support astronomy and science in the United States. And Congress people really loved talking to John. They always, whenever they had questions about science, they would call him up and he would be happy to go there. And, and he was a, really a wonderful advocate for science with, with Congress. And, and at some point, I heard some of them talk about him and, and, and they said they loved talking to him because they felt, which I think was true, that he was very honest with them, that he told them the story uh, as it was, truly as it was. He told them the bad and the good about any particular thing. He, of course, always tried to convince them why the good outweighed the bad, but he always told them the truth. He, and he put it on the table and, you know, he was very smart. He won the national debate championship when he was in high school. And so he knew how to argue and how to debate and how to do those things. But he would frequently go to those congressmen, senators and, and congress. And the truth is he actually liked them a lot. You know, many of us, you'd hear us say a lot of not such nice things about them, <laughs> to put it mildly, but he liked them. Many of them were very bright, not all, but bright people who really tried to do their job. So he appreciated that. And they felt it. They felt that he really liked them and appreciated them and understood that they're trying to do their job. And you know, they, you get the feeling if you sort of look down at them or you really appreciate them. But he would frequently go and say, when he met with senators and congressmen, he would say, look, uh, I'm just an ordinary scientist. I'll just tell you my views as an ordinary scientist. You are the one who makes the national, you know. So he would come with that attitude to them and they loved it. And um, one of them said, uh, you know, and they're smart people, and they said he had that style which is called, I never heard the term before, but I heard it after that, had the style, it's called that I'm just uh, an old, how, how is it? Uh, old, old country, country uh, lawyer or something. <laughs> So they understood that, that I'm just an old country lawyer. I don't really know that much about it, but here is what it is. <laughs> and they knew that he was one of the top scientists in the world, so they listened very carefully. But it was that the style that he got went to them, and they really appreciated it. I really want to thank Netta for really giving us a, some great insights and, and, and a very entertaining talk this morning. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.